Hi everyone, we're moving ahead with the first module now, which is aircraft performance. So over the next few lectures, we're going to develop the relationship that help us understand some very fundamental aircraft parameters that, well, give us aircraft performance. So let's just refer to the website to look at what we're going to be covering in aircraft performance. If we can look on here, I'm just going to go you know, read through these. I don't particularly like having text and then talking around it, so we'll try and go through these very quickly. If we're going to be developing relationships for how an aircraft goes from A to B, at some point we're going to have to define aircraft speed. Now it's not as simple as defining speed would be for a ground vehicle, so we have to define a series of different airspeeds. So we've got indicated, calibrated, equivalent and true airspeed. We've also then got wind, so we can add that or subtract it from our true airspeed to get ground speed. So we're going to develop relationships for each of these, define what they are, and you guys are going to be able to convert between them. We're then going to develop some really important parameters. We want to know at what speed will an aircraft stall, because that dictates the slowest an aircraft can possibly fly. Uh, in most cases can dictate that. We can also find that there are some cases where an aircraft cannot maintain cruise at that speed. And that's all to do with the variation of thrust and the power produced by the power plant. So we're going to look at that. I want you guys to be able to demonstrate, and we're going to get there, why flying at the minimum drag speed, which again you guys are going to be able to develop, why that is just about neutrally stable, Flight above the minimum drag speed is stable, but flight below it is unstable. So we're going to talk about that. Then, given a set of parameters describing the power plant of an aircraft, either a jet or a turboprop, or a prop or a high bypass ratio turbofan, you guys are going to be able to define the maximum and the minimum cruise speeds for a given altitude. And you're going to define those in both true airspeed and equivalent airspeed. And you could also do them in indicated and calibrated, but we won't use those so much. We're going to introduce the concept of the highest altitude an aircraft can possibly maintain cruise at, and we'll call that the aircraft ceiling. And we're then going to look at, given a given mass of fuel, what is the longest an aircraft can fly for, its endurance, and how does that differ for gliders, propeller-driven aircraft, and turbojet aircraft. And we're then going to look at the how how long an aircraft can fly, so how, how far an aircraft can fly. So the maximum distance between takeoff and landing, that's the range. And again, how that differs for a glider, a propeller-driven aircraft, or a turbojet aircraft. We're going to look at the parameters all around cruise, and we're then going to look at glide and climb. We're looking at very well. We're looking at slow glide and climb, such that it's a steady rate of descent or a steady rate of ascent. And we're then going to look at accelerated flight. Accelerated flight meaning there is a load that pulls the aircraft out of equilibrium, so the lift is maybe no longer equal to the weight, and this then enables us to start looking at manoeuvres. So for this, we need to look at defining the VN diagram of the aircraft, and we're going to talk more about that. And then we're going to look at manoeuvres of, I'm trying to think what we're covering now, we're going to be looking at loops, we're going to be looking at pull-ups, um, we're going to be looking at steady turns, we're, sorry, we're looking at, uh, yeah, steady turns as well. So we're going to be looking at all of those, and you're going to be able to define things like the minimum turn radius, the minimum radius for constant load factor turns, and the minimum radius for... Uh, constant radius, sorry, constant radius loops as well. So we're going to be looking at all of those. Now, just referring to the website again, I'm going to stop referring to it so much. I expect you guys to be looking at this as we go through things. If we look at the parameters for two aircraft up here, we've got the Wright Flyer, which first flew December seventeenth, nineteen o three. Compare it to a more modern aircraft. Not that modern, really, a Boeing 747. But just by comparison of the parameters, we can see that there's a big difference in the way that aircraft have evolved over the last 100 years. The de equations that we're developing for these aircraft are valid for both of those. So we're developing the absolute fundamental physics to help us understand how an aircraft gets from A to B. And that is the discipline of aircraft performance. So. I don't, like I say, I don't like doing lots of stuff on 
the screen behind me um, in terms of text, so I prefer to do it all sort of handwritten. Those were the lectures that I preferred as an undergraduate and those are that's the styles that I've tried to emulate. So what we're going to be looking at today is defining aircraft speed. And this is difficult for, sorry, more, it's more difficult for a flight vehicle than it would be for a ground-based vehicle. And there's a couple of reasons for this. So if, for example, we're looking at our aircraft needs to go from A to B, which is some distance along the ground. And we'll call this distance D here. We then have our aircraft, which is in the air, so we're neglecting the fact that it has to take off. There we go, it's my beautiful aircraft. And our aircraft is flying along at some speed, which we'll call V. So if we want to determine the time taken to get between those two, well, we know that time is equal to distance divided by speed. Now, the speed that we would care about for this one here, let's just call this, I'll write this in words here because I don't want to use S for speed. Okay, the speed that we would care about in terms of how fast an aircraft gets from A to B, this is speed relative to ground. And this has introduced our first speed for our aircraft, so we'll call this ground speed. Or V with a subscript G, VG. The speed that the aircraft is flying, or the speed of it re the speed of the aircraft relative to the air through which it is traversing, is this one here which we'll call true airspeed, or is called true airspeed. Oh, that's some old notes from something else I was doing. We don't need that up there. <laughs> okay, let's, uh, let's move those out. I don't need that here. I'd rather have a bit more space on this page. Let's, uh, move that up here. Okay, there we go, I've got a bit more space now. Sorry about that, guys. I thought this was a blank slate. Okay, so this speed here is the one that the, the difference between the aircraft and the air through which it's traveling. So this is the speed of aircraft, speed relative to air through which the aircraft is flying. And this one is given the name true airspeed. And you'll see this being called a couple of things. It can be called TAS, T-A-S, or just V. V with no subscript. So if we don't have a subscript, we've got true airspeed. So why might that be different to ground speed? Well, we could have a tailwind, for example, on our aircraft. V subscript W. So this gives us our first relationship here. We could say V G is equal to V plus V W. So ground speed is equal to true airspeed plus wind speed. And it's important to note that the convention obviously here is that a tailwind is positive because if headwind is then negative, it would then subtract from the speed. And that in general is why it takes longer to fly from Europe to America than it takes to fly from America to Europe because of the prevailing tailwind going in the correct direction or in one of the directions, not necessarily the correct direction. So we've got our first set of relationships here. 
so the one that we want to know a lot of the time is this ground speed and this is going to help us because this is what we need for things like calculations of distance and time and in order to determine it we need to be able to measure this one here which is the true airspeed so we need to measure the true airspeed and we need to think about a means that we can do this We don't necessarily need to think about it, we need to just learn about how it's done, because obviously this problem was solved years ago, we're not developing anything new here. So we're going to say measuring airspeed. The way that airspeed is measured is using a pitot static. Now, if you took MME 315 with me, we used the pitot-static probe to measure the velocity distribution in an axisymmetric jet. So if we can remember the way that a pitot-static works, I'm going to draw a very crude one now. Let's say we've got a pitot-static with a total pressure coming down here. And let's draw a probe around it. And we have a static pressure coming down here. So we've got oncoming velocity, V infinity, where infinity means our free stream velocity. Let's use a black pen for that. And then these two pressures are somehow measured in the pressure measurement system. We're not looking at how pressure measurement systems work in this course. We covered that in 315. So we've got going into this one, We've got total pressure, P0, which means that we have P0 in this half of the diaphragm. And we've then got static pressure, PA, in this half here. So the way that we can do these, let's just imagine that we had a diaphragm connected to a piston, which then measures, or is connected to a dial, effectively, that can move in this direction. And marked along here, we can then measure the difference between those two pressures, delta P. So delta P is equal to P naught minus P A. Okay. There we go. Let's check I'm in, in in the notes I think I've called that yeah, I've called static pressure P without the subscript A. Um, let's keep that consistent with the notes, in fact, so let's take the A's off of here. Okay, so P is static pressure. Let's just call all of these here. So we've got static, and we've got total pressure. And what we end up measuring is delta P, which is this pressure difference. So we're measuring a pressure difference because that's what we can measure using a pitot-static probe. But what we want is this air speed. So we need a means to develop that. Now, if you can remember from MMA 315, we used Bernoulli's equation. Again, written down by Euler, so it's called Bernoulli's equation for some reason. You might think that we could then use Bernoulli's equation to come up with something like this. We could say V is equal to the square root of 2 times delta P divided by rho. And that's what we used in MMA 315 to get the velocity distribution in a jet. So what we're doing there is we're taking the delta P, which is this impact pressure, the difference between the total and the static, so let's just call that over here. This is called, quote, impact pressure. And over here is we're dividing it by rho, which is the density. Now we could use that in MME 315 
because our flow was so slow that it was okay to make the assumption that it was incompressible. So we're not going to be able to use that for this course because that's only valid for incompressible flow. So we can't use that. We have to use a slightly more horrendous equation for this one. So the equation that we do is a is a function of the delta p, which is what we want, and it gives us the velocity. V is equal to the square root of 7 multiplied by the static pressure divided by the density multiplied by, and I can't remember this one this year. By the end of a couple of lectures, I'll be able to remember this. Delta P on P plus 1 divided by gamma minus 1 on gamma minus 1. And this is all in the square root. So this gives us the velocity associated with a pressure difference, which is here. And then we've got some other, other parameters in here. Now in the notes, I go through the derivation of this because I, you tend not to see the derivation of this equation in flight mechanics textbooks. I'd like you guys to see where it comes from. So look at the notes, see where it comes from. Let's just list off the quantities that we've got in here. Static pressure. We've got density. We've got impact pressure. We'll put in brackets, this is what the Peter static measures. We've got, again, we've got static pressure. We've got one, which is one. Um, and we've got the ratio of specific heats in here. Okay, so in terms of things, we'll go through these one by one and we'll treat them. So the static pressure, we're not measuring the static pressure yet. So we don't know what the static pressure is. This is an unknown. Density, we also don't know what the density is. We know that at sea level, the density is 1.225 kilograms per cubic meter, but we don't know what it is at altitude yet. So we might have to measure it, for example. The impact pressure, this is good, because this is what we can measure with our pitot-static probe. We can take our pitot-static here, we could supply pressure differences across it in the laboratory and calibrate it such that this scale here was producing the correct value of delta P. So that bit we can do. And then again, we've got the static pressure here, which we'll put a question mark on. Ratio of specific heats, this is 1.4. Okay, for a diatomic gas, it is exactly 1.4. There's a great link on the website I show about that, um, which is a nice little bit of physics that I didn't actually learn until I had done my PhD. But it's a cool fact that it's exactly 1.4 for, uh, for diatomic gases, which is mostly what is in our atmosphere. Um, go and look at that at your leisure. But the issue that we have here is we have this equation now. We've got this equation that helps us determine the true airspeed. So let's label that as well, which is what we want to know as a function of a couple of things. So it's the impact pressure, which is what we will have from our Peter static, and the static pressure and the density here. Now, we could use that to determine the true airspeed at altitude if we were to also measure these things somehow. So let's say here, option measure P and rho. Now the issue with measuring these two things is these would have to require some form of absolute transducer. And we'll say that's costly. I just should use dollars because I'm here now. I'm in America. Those are costly. They go out of calibration, require certification. It's added expense to an aircraft measurement system. So we, we won't do that. So the way that flight scientists, the way that aerodynamicists first solved this was they said, okay, we're going to look at this equation here. 
and we're going to realize rather than actually using this equation to solve for this airspeed we're going to go back to our measurement system here and we're going to calibrate it on the earth at sea level not so it's measuring delta p but we'll do it so it's measuring something else across here which we'll call calibrated airspeed so it's zero they worked out what the number was when there was no airspeed and they put a zero there they then put say 50 knots using some other flow measurement device worked out where the dial went put 50 there that's a very crude representation of what they did but effectively that is what that's what they produced so they introduced calibrated airspeed So what that is in effect doing, even though it's not actually solving an equation, it's just putting some numbers onto a dial, it is solving that true airspeed equation for P, sorry, rho is equal to rho sea, sea level, which is 1.225 kilograms per cubic meter. And for pressure is equal to the pressure at sea level, which is 101.325 pascals. Okay, those are numbers which you'll eventually just know, or you may know already. So we'll have a think about what this is doing, because this isn't that useful to us just yet. Okay, so we've now got an air, we've got this calibrated airspeed meter, or we've got something that's capable of measuring something called calibrated airspeed. So if we have our aircraft, I will bring an aircraft model for my next few lectures. I've got this paper airplane for now. This airspeed indicator that's showing us this calibrated airspeed would give us the correct value of true airspeed only if the aircraft is flying at sea level. So we can say CAS is equal to TAS if and only if our altitude is equal to zero. Not that useful yet, but we're going to work out how we can take this calibrated airspeed and convert it to true airspeed. So let's think about what that's solving. So it's solving the TAS equation for rho is equal to rho sea level and P is equal to P sea level. So we can write that out. So we'll say VC. So let's write this here. Calibrated airspeed is either CAS or VC. We'll say VC is equal to the square root of 7 multiplied by, now previously we had P divided by rho. So we've got P sea level divided by rho sea level and then inside the bracket we've got delta p which is the impact pressure that we're measuring that doesn't change divided by no that's p sea level p sea level plus one to the power of gamma minus one on gamma minus one all square rooted that is effectively what our dial that we've just written the numbers on at sea level is producing. It's producing this calibrated airspeed. I'm saying here that is an effect what's being solved it's not actually what's happening okay but it's a way we can think about how these different air speeds work so we have this calibrated air speed now we need a means to take calibrated air speed and get true air speed out of it so we need to get calibrated air speed and take it to true air speed now we're going to do that in a two-step process And the two steps 
are going to be pretty logical how we're going to do them because let's have a think about what we've done here. So the things that are different here is that we've got P sea level instead of the density, sorry, the, the pressure at altitude, and we've got rho sea level instead of the density at altitude. So we've got two things that are different here. So we're going to account for those two things separately and sequentially. So our first step, we're going to account for the pressure. So we're going to account for a pressure correction. Secondly, we're then going to account for the density correction. So let's have a look at what we do with that pressure correction. So, okay, I'm missing out indicated SV. We'll go back to that at the end, that's fine. Okay, so we're going to introduce something new for this first step. Okay, for our pressure correction. Now what this does is it takes our calibrated airspeed and it turns it into equivalent airspeed, EAS, which is V subscript E. So we're taking equivalent airspeed. So if we imagine what we've got now, we've got our calibrated airspeed we want a means to convert it, so we just need to take wherever we had a PSL, so we've got two of them in there, we're going to turn them into the pressure at altitude. So then we know that this equivalent airspeed, which is VC with P in place, PSL is going to be equal to the square root of 7 multiplied by the pressure at altitude divided by rho sea level multiplied by delta P divided by the actual pressure at altitude plus 1 gamma minus 1 on gamma minus 1 all square rooted. So there must be something that helps us to convert between these two airspeeds. Because we've introduced this idea of this equivalent airspeed, but we're not quite certain how we get there yet. So we say that our equivalent airspeed is equal to some function multiplied by Vc. Take our two expressions that we have before, let's zoom out a little bit, so we've got Ve here and Vc here, if Ve divided by Vc is equal to the function that we need to create we can see and in the notes I go through and I show the division, we can effectively see that it's some function of delta P and P. Okay, so this, whatever this correction function is, it has to be a function of delta P and P. So let's put this down here. So let's think about what these terms actually mean. We're, we're measuring delta P and we're not really measuring P. So it's what we have, although we're not actually measuring delta P because we said that we would write the numbers for calibrated airspeed on. So I'm going to put in brackets calibrated airspeed is just this function of delta P. So we can then say that 
our function is actually going to be a function of Vc instead of delta P. And then pressure, this is therefore just going to be a function of the altitude. Because we know that the pressure falls with altitude and we'll introduce some methodologies that we can use to develop those altitude functions using Python a little bit later. So we then need some function that varies with both forward speed and the altitude. So we're going to do that. Let's uh, bring in the table here. This table's in the notes. Um, and I also included an interpolation function on the website. This particular table is borrowed from Tom Yekout's textbook, but it's such a standard table that I think he almost only borrowed it from elsewhere as well. So what we have here, we have this pressure correction factor. So what we can see is that we've got increasing forward speed. And then we've got increasing altitude. So we've got this function. Now it's important to note that it's a number always less than one. And it gets smaller with altitude and it gets smaller with forward speed. So we can infer something about this already. We can say, well, we know Vc is going to be less than Ve. Our calibrated airspeed is going to be less than our, sorry, our, we're in that the wrong way around. I heard it as I was about to say it out loud. Our equivalent airspeed has got to be less than our calibrated airspeed. So let me just cross it out. If my iPad catches up with me. Okay, so our calibrated airspeed is going to be larger than our equivalent airspeed. Okay, and that's going to help us sense check some of our answers a little bit later. So what I want you guys to do is have a look at the table on here that's available in the notes. I want you to look at the interpolation function that I also provide. I want you to see, okay, can I use that? So let's just show you whether it's in the notes now. Okay, so we've got here, this is under the heading where we've got indicate, uh, sorry, equivalent airspeed. This is the same table from the Yakout textbook. And if we run the code here, okay, we can see that we've got an interpolation function. Now, all I've done is I've hard coded in these values, which is not necessarily the best coding practice, but we can then test this for different altitudes. So I'm going to replace, you guys will need to do this as well. So let's have a look at our table up here. So I've got calibrated airspeed on the horizontal axis and I've got and I've got uh, altitude in feet on the vertical axis. So if I want to say get a value straight out of the table, 150 knots, 20,000 feet, that should give me 0 0.993. So 150, 20,000 feet, okay, 0 0.993, there we go. And that's just taking those values straight out from the table. So that, that works and we know it, okay? If we want to use intermediate values now, say I want to use H, sorry, I say my calibrated airspeed is equal to 160 knots and my altitude is equal to, let's just interpolate in one direction. Let's say 100, 160 knots and 40,000 feet. It should be somewhere between those two. Hundred sixty knots, forty thousand feet. Pressure correction is point nine seven zero eight, which is more precision than it had. But there we go. We see we get a value between these two on the table. Okay, this is just doing a. I think it's just yeah linear interpolation in two dimension. I want you to take this piece of code, check you understand how it works. You know you could do this by hand, but since we're not doing any hand examinations, I'm not particularly going to examine you guys on doing interpolation by hand. Um, it would have been in the course previously. Let's go back to the whiteboard. 
So we've got our calibrated airspeed now. Now this is one step closer to true airspeed. We've done our pressure correction and this is F is a function of calibrated airspeed and altitude. We now need a density correction. So how are we going to do that? Because the density correction is going to, firstly let's just label this a little bit. So our pressure correction takes our calibrated airspeed and turns it into equivalent airspeed. Our density correction is going to take equivalent airspeed and turn it into true airspeed. So let's think about how that's going to work. So let's write these out. So we're going to end up with something. We're going to have V, our true airspeed is equal to VE multiplied by something, which we'll call, um, let's just call it K for now. So K is equal to V divided by VE. So we can take our expressions for each of these and put them in here. So we've got the square root of seven P on row C level multiplied by delta P divided by P plus one gamma minus one and gamma minus one. That's gonna be divided by seven. I've got those the wrong way around, sorry, that should be row on top, not row C level, because this top one is true airspeed. This bottom one is P divided by row C level. So thankfully, everything cancels in these. Okay, so we see everything's gonna cancel except for, we're gonna end up with square root of one on row divided by one on square root of row C level, which is equal to the square root of row C level divided by row. Remember rho is just our density. So we've got here V is equal to, our true airspeed is equal to equivalent airspeed by the square root sigma C level divided by sigma. And let's just put a box around this. This is our density correction. So we've got true airspeed, equivalent airspeed, density at altitude, whatever altitude we happen to be at, and then we've got sea level density. Okay, now so many things are a function of the relationships between the density that we give it a name. Okay, so we say that we're gonna use this a lot. We're gonna say that rho divided by rho sea level, we're gonna give this a name, we just call it sigma. This is our density ratio. So how do we know what the density ratio is? Well, there's a couple of ways we can do it. If we are certain altitude up to around about 20, sorry, up to about 16 kilometers, we can use sigma is equal to 20 minus h divided by 20 plus h, where h is in kilometers. Okay, we can use that because we're not doing many quick handwritten examinations, I'm not going to let you guys really use that at all, but I want you guys to be aware of it. Ultimately, the way that we determine what sigma is, and thereby what the relationship is between equivalent and true airspeed, is by looking up the density at different altitudes. There's a couple of different ways we can do this. Um, 
the way that we would have done this in the old course was by looking at these density tables. So we can see here we've got the properties of the US standard atmosphere, we've got the altitudes, we've got altitudes below sea level, at sea level, all the way up to 80 kilometers. And I've got the density in some annoying units here. This is actually then in Pascal's times, sorry, this, sorry, this is in uh, kilograms per cubic meter times 10. So we've got 1.225 at sea level and density is in general decreasing with altitude. But because you guys are always gonna have a computer pretty much, let's have a look at a way that we could do this in Python. Okay, so we're gonna look at doing this in Python. So switch over to a Jupyter notebook. Now I include, all of this is included in the accompanying notes, but we're gonna talk through how to do it. If you have MATLAB to hand, we'd use one of the atmospheric models that's available in MATLAB. Atmos ISA is very useful. There's other ones, Atmos Coasa. Doesn't really matter which one you use for these. We're just gonna use some atmospheric model. Now, the way that the density varies in the atmosphere, it's not constant around the globe. It's not constant from day to day. It's not constant uh, depending on latitude or longitude. So we have models that we can use. We have standard atmosphere models. There's ISA, the International Standard Atmosphere, and there's a few others that I can't actually remember the name of. So what these different models do is they enable us to look at the variation of different atmospheric models. So we're looking at things like pressure, density, temperature, okay? And also the viscosity as well, though we don't really use that in this course. We're looking at how we vary those properties through the atmosphere. So we could use those tables and do it manually. We can import one of these modules. So one of them here is atmosphere, which is really useful. It's a, a model, module available within Python. So I can say my sea level atmosphere is equal to an atmosphere. So I've imported this atmosphere module. I want the atmosphere at zero meters or sea level. Let's give that an E there. Now it hasn't produced anything useful for me yet because I, I need to look at the different properties here. So I'm gonna say print, now I'm gonna use an F string for this. The pressure at sea level is, and the part that I want to get out of here, I'm gonna say it's sea level atmosphere dot pressure okay perfect now it's taking this out as a that's either a list or a numpy array so let's take the only part of that out it gives me a number okay let's try looking at other altitudes okay so let's say let's call this out atmosphere Let's look at 10 kilometers, so 10,000 meters. Okay, so let's print out what the pressure is there. I'm aware that we're not supposed to be looking at pressure, but let's say, let's make this an altitude. Okay, so we're gonna have a look at that property coming out. And the units that come out are SI units, okay? Silly number of decimal places there, so let's give this, let's say I want one before the decimal, and let's say two decimal places, okay? So the pressure at 10 kilometers is 26,499 pascals. So if we do pressure, we can do something very similar with density now. So let's say, let's check this is working. Now we know, well, we know the density was 101325 pascals at sea level, because that's what we know. So let's say the density. The, so the density should be 1.225 kilograms per cubic meter. It's giving me a silly number. So let's say, let's give this four decimal places. There we go, and let's have a look at what the density is at altitude now. Uh, 
Okay, so the density at 10 kilometers is 0.4135 kilograms per cubic meter. So remember the definition of our density correction, our density ratio. It's the density at altitude divided by the density at sea level. So let's have a look at what this would be. So, so the density ratio at 10 kilometers is going to be equal to that divided by the density at sea level. There we go. That doesn't have units though, that's a unitless quantity. Okay, so we've got our density ratio now. We could also have a look at this um, versus altitude. So let's say, let's just let's compare this versus altitude. That's my MATLAB programming showing. I am using the wrong commenting string. So we'll compare versus altitude. So we'll make an MP array that goes from say zero to 50 kilometers. So we can put all of these into atmosphere. So atmosphere is equal to atmosphere altitudes times 1000 to give us the altitude in meters. And let's plot these out. So we need to import matplotlib dots pi plots. That's PLT. And then we're going to plot the altitude in kilometers. Sorry, plot the let's plot the density ratio versus altitude. So let's say dens ratio is equal to atmospheres, which is this atmospheres we've just created, divided by the density at sea level, which we know is 1.225. And then we can just plot this out. So we'll do plt.figure, plt.plot, and along the x-axis, I want altitudes. And along the y-axis, I want the density ratio. Why isn't it like this? Because oh, I want that to be mp.lin space. Sorry, that's my fault. Uh, okay, that's, let's say atmosphere. Why isn't it like that? Atmosphere is zero. It's not gonna like that. Okay, it's not liking this because again, this is what I don't do these Beforehand, I'd like to just see if I can get them to work. I'm going to have to do this as a list comprehension. So let's say, um, that should work now. Ooh, not working very well here, is it? So let's go through and see how I did this here when I did it, because I know I've done this before. I'm just struggling a little bit here. Okay. There we go, so I'm quite good with the physics. I'm not quite so great at the coding side of things always. So let's see what I've got here. Okay, so I've got an array of these atmospheres. Okay, that's fine. So let's atmospheres dot. Okay. That should work. Why is that not iterable? There we go, that seems to have worked. There we go, Oof, got there in the end, okay. So now what we're doing is plotting the density ratio. Again, this code's available here. You guys can copy it, go through it. Again, I've put the code on the website as well. It's very hot in here and I don't do well under pressure, but, which is not a joke about the atmosphere. 
we've got plotted here, we've got the altitude and we've got the density ratio. So let's do plt.x label um, altitude in kilometers. And then I want the y label to be the density ratio. Let's make that sigma because that's what it is. Okay, so we've got, there we go, we've got altitude and kilometers and we've got the density ratio. So we can see that it's always going to be less than one. So what's that telling us? Let's go back over here. Let's uh, remove this. So we found out the density ratio is always going to be less than one and we know how to calculate that. So let's have a look here. So let's just zoom out a second. The density ratio is P divided by PSL. So V is therefore equal to VE divided by, sorry, multiplied by sigma to the minus a half. Okay, so it's not equal to square root of sigma, it's equal to the square root of one over sigma. So if sigma is always gonna be less than one, that means that one over sigma, or one over the square root of sigma is always gonna be greater than one. So V is always gonna be greater than VE. Okay, so we've got our different relationships. Now let's just move on to showing how they vary. So we've got one, two, and three. So we've got calibrated airspeed, equivalent airspeed, and true airspeed. And that's their respective magnitudes. So this first step is multiply by the pressure correction factor, which is a function of VC and the altitude. Second step is multiply by sigma to the minus a half. Sigma is equal to the density at altitude divided by the density at sea level. So we've got C, E, and T, calibrated, equivalent, and true airspeed. There's two more that we need, one of which we've sort of already alluded to. This is ground speed, VG. So we add on VW. Now we've got one further airspeed that we actually see displayed in the cockpit. The one that is displayed is indicated airspeed. So you might ask me if it's one that's often given in the cockpit, why on earth haven't I mentioned it? Well, indicated airspeed is what the airspeed indicator is actually showing. Now let's have a think about why it might be different from calibrated airspeed. If we've got the nose of our aircraft and we've got a pitot-static mounted, say, here, we're looking down the center line of our aircraft now. The flow, by the point that it reaches our pitot-static, may already be accelerated somewhat, or it's been disturbed by the aircraft somehow. So we've got VI being measured here. Okay, it's what's being measured. It's gonna be slightly different to if we had a perfect transducer mounted over here. So we introduce a correction and we just call this position correction. Given the symbol delta VP and we say calibrated airspeed is equal to indicated airspeed plus delta VP. And this is therefore given usually in units of what we'll say speed. That's either going to be knots or meters per second. It depends how the question is being framed, it depends what system we've got. So we've got that system over here. We've got plus delta VP. So those are our different sorts of airspeeds and how we correct between them all. Okay. First one, indicated airspeed. It's what's being displayed. Add on the position error, delta VP, gives us calibrated airspeed. We then multiply by the pressure correction, which is a function of calibrated airspeed and the altitude, gives us equivalent airspeed. We then multiply that by the density correction, which is one over the square root of sigma, 
gives us true airspeed. True airspeed is the speed of the aircraft relative to the air through which it is flying. We add on wind speed and that's going to give us ground speed. Okay, so if we want to know how to go from A to B and we've got, sorry, we want to know how long it takes to go from A to B and we're given the indicated airspeed, we need to know what's the position error, what's the altitude we're flying at, and once we know the altitude we're flying at, we can work out the pressure correction from the table, and we can work out the density correction from standard relationships of the density for a standard atmosphere. If we're told a wind speed, we add that on. If we're told it's a tailwind, we take it away, and that gives us ground speed. Okay, it's a ground speed we use for distance and time calculations. So that's a good introduction to the different types of airspeed, how we convert between them. I want you guys to review the lecture and go through the accompanying notes when we're looking at this. So the accompanying notes have got examples of how we do these. So I want you to be looking at these different equations, how they work, and then the pressure correction table, and then how we work out the sigma ratio here. So I've got another is this running? Yeah, it is running. So for example, I have written something in here. I, let's have a look. We've done all the same sort of calculations we've got here. I don't know if this is now running, so let's just check the live code is going. Launching. We'll get there. Okay, so now this notebook's working. Let's check all of these are going. So 160, let's call this 170 to check this notebook is running. Apparently it's not. Things don't work very well when I'm asking you guys to do it. I think I, I, it's because I'm editing the pages and then working with them. So if that stops working, reload the page, press live code again. It's been built, launching, takes a moment to build. There we go, so let's go down and check. We can go all of these to work. I'd like you to look at these codes and just check you can get them to work. You'll see there's a deliberate mistake in here that I haven't put VC and 4500 here. So you want to put 4500, not 45,000. You need to change these to VC and H in there. We can then look at effectively the code that we wrote today in the Jupyter Notebook. And I've then introduced a function called sigma density that enables us to work out the density ratio for a given altitude. And that can be meters, feet, or miles. So we can run that. And we can then look at the density ratio at different altitudes. And what I've then started to do is compare, for example, that approximation that I said that we're not going to use but we need to be aware of. We can then look at how that varies with at different altitude. Okay, so that's again this plot is being produced by this code here. So there's nothing I'm hiding from you guys. We then go through a summary of corrections. And what I'd like you guys to do is go through these problems on the page. Okay, the solutions are available in all of these. I want you guys to go through the problems for Wednesday. Okay, we're going to go through them in the review session. These numbers here will change each time the code's updated. Okay, so you're not going crazy if if you think they've changed. Every time the book gets pushed out by me, these change slightly. Try and go through it without looking at the solution, but you can look at the solution if you want to go through it. Okay, it shows you how to do everything, but I would like you guys to have a look at it. Okay, and try and answer some of these questions in theory here. There's some parts that I haven't necessarily mentioned yet in the lecture, but there's parts that are spoken about here okay so I want to go through those in the review session on Wednesday particularly here so what's the significance of equivalent airspeed and I want you to think about that question and then we can talk about that on Wednesday okay um, I'm going to go ahead and record the next lecture anyway it might be available this week we'll see um, and then we'll go through these questions in the review session on Wednesday and we'll start progressing more I hope you guys have enjoyed today and I look forward to continuing this course with you guys. Take care.